Let's do it again. <laughs> Woo! Let's go. Ah, it's gonna be a good day. Good day. Good day. Hey, we are in the middle of a series in our church talking about intimacy with God. It's a it's a beautiful series. I think it's a fundamental series. To be honest, I think it's one of the best series we have ever done. And I've I've had the privilege of sharing a few messages within that series. And the last one was a message about intimacy with the Father. And we defined intimacy, we talked about intimacy. I gave I think I gave like five tips on how to keep your intimacy, the habit of confession and all of that. But today I want to talk about the thieves of intimacy. I think it's just as important for us to to understand how intimacy can be stolen from us as well as we should understand what intimacy is. And I, I want to talk about three areas. I want to talk about the obvious, the not so obvious and the oblivious. <laughs> three words that are going to bring something to your memory. The obvious, the not so obvious and the oblivious. So the obvious thieves of your intimacy, I, I mean, 2024, we all know you're probably watching this on the phone. So what are the thieves of intimacy in your life? Your phone is one of them. Like so, it, it brings so much distraction. You know, it's like our attention spans going down and we just, we want to, we want to learn something in three seconds, which is impossible. My hooks in my videos are terrible. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how to keep it a person hooked on the video with three seconds. So phones are a distraction. The internet's a distraction. You know, back in the days, if you put in a paper together or you're studying, you had to go to the library. Do you know what the library is? You had to go to the library and you had to figure out what books were you gonna look for in order to do your research. Like you had to think about the books before you actually started the research. Nowadays, you just go on Google, type whatever you want or open AI or chat GPT and it, it does it for you. you no, know, the internet's a distraction. Uh, a lot of philosophers nowadays are talking about the future of humankind with AI. It's, it's full of distractions. The internet's a distraction. Being busy is a distraction. What, what an excuse in our calendar. You know, most of us will go, oh, you know, why are you not doing this? Why are you not doing that? How's your life with God? Why are you struggling with this? And most, most people, you know, it's fair to say that most people will go, oh, I've, I've just been so busy. It's just, you know, life is going on and I'm leaving this right now. I'm guilty. I'm moving houses and I'm trying to do things. And I came to the studio trying to, we, we're busy. And then we, we, we exchange priorities. We prioritize what's not important and we don't prioritize what should be our priority. God, we, we remember to get up in the morning and, and do X, Y, and Z, but we don't remember to maybe do our devotional, maybe just to be thankful, just to express gratitude during the day. So. Being busy is a distraction, obvious. You know, these are the obvious things. The phone, the internet, being busy. I think money is one of the obvious distractions. You know, a lot of people are living for money and Jesus was very, very clear. You cannot serve two gods. You either serve God or serve money. So if you're, if you're, in, if you're in the rat's wheel, try to get this and get that. It's always the next thing. You know, I've talked about this so many times in my podcast, but it's just, you know, money is a, it's one of the greatest distractions. What are you going to do with it if you amount to a million dollars or $10 million? Like, actually, we've, we've learned recently with the pandemic that money doesn't really save anyone from anything. Y yeah, it's good to have money. It's good to enjoy, but it is a distraction and we have to be aware of that. That's the obvious thing. In our lives, there's, there's this area of not so obvious situations and circumstances that we fall into. And that could be a distraction. Uh, a big one for me is ego. You know, we, um, we're proud. I'm, I'm a proud person. And I, I don't mean to be condemning, you know, like bringing condemnation on you. But most of us have a level of pride that gets in the way of God. You know, why are you not having your time with God? Oh, you know what? I've, I've read the Bible three times already. And that's pride. Like, really? Three times? The Word of God, the living sword like, like, that pierces your soul three times, you think it's enough? That's pride. You know, why are you not doing this? Why not? You, know, you might be having trouble with your children, like raising your children, and, and you get some counsel, and why are you not doing it? Why are you not putting it to practice? Pride. You know, pride is a, is a big thing. It's a, you know, we want to conquer. We, we grew up with this idea. We want to conquer things. So uh, that's not so obvious. It's not so easy to identify. 
Another one is knowledge. <laughs> I, I simply love this one. And I'll tell you why. I love books. I read books quite a lot. Like I have Bibles. Just this weekend, we were, we, uh, my wife and I, we stopped at, uh, at the mall on our day off. It's a Friday. And um, she, we, we were on our way to a friend's house for a barbecue. We had no business stopping in the mall. No business whatsoever. But we stopped at the mall, grabbed the coffee, and then at the end of the tunnel, like the light at the end of the tunnel, I saw this kiosk and they had books and I love books. And I'm like, I don't know, something just drew me there. You know, like something dragged me there. And like before I knew it, I was like, I had six books under my arms and I was like $50 poor. And I was like, oh, I bought the books. And my wife was like, why'd you buy the books? We're moving, we don't have any place to store. And I was like, honey, there's always place for books in our house because I love knowledge. But the Bible is very clear. The knowledge puffs up. And sometimes knowledge gets in the way of our intimacy with God as well. Do you believe that? Because I have found that in my journey, and I've only been doing this for 20 years, so maybe I'm wrong, but I've found that in my journey, the more I know, the more questions I have. Like the philosophers used to say, um, I, I, I think therefore I exist that Descartes, uh, but that starts with the questioning. Most people don't know that, but he was questioning himself. Like, I question things. And because I question, therefore I think, therefore I exist. So my existence, my being, my reason for being relies on my capacity to question. And I can only question if I absorb knowledge. Because if you don't have any knowledge, you don't even know what you ask. So the more you know, the more questions you have. And most people are sort of scared of questions because they think God will be offended with their questions. Uh, one of the big questions we ask God is why? Why did you allow this to happen to me, God? Why me? Um, and it's not new. This is a four or five thousand year problem. You know, the <laughs> prophet Elijah had the same thing. He was in the cave. Like, why me? I'm the only one. Like, shh, shh, shut up, watch, go. Uh, so it's just like, it's not new. But we, you know, knowledge gets in our way. And um, I think there is a big difference between knowledge and wisdom. And when you read the book of Proverbs, for example, Solomon says, seek wisdom. Seek knowledge as well, because that's the first step. But wisdom shouts from the marketplace. So what's wisdom? In, in practical terms, in simple terms, I think I could say that wisdom is knowledge put into practice. But you can only put your practice if you know what you do with it. It's like the manual. You got to read the manual in order to assemble whatever you, you want to assemble. So knowledge is not so obvious because it's good. Like we, we want people with knowledge. We want people who can have a good conversation, who can teach us, who can instruct us. But uh, it is a big barrier because you think you know it all. Have you, have you met someone like that? They, they think they know it all. It's annoying, isn't it? It's, it's a pain in the it's a pain in the neck, for lack of a better word. You know, it's just like ah, oh, that person thinks they know it all, and they might do. Uh, fair enough, okay, fair game. They might do. They might know it all, but it's just annoying to hang out with people like that. So, ego is a big one. Knowledge is a big one, and I think one that's not so obvious, but it's like. It shows up in every area of our lives. It's idolatry. Idolatry. Like we were just talking about money. And the reason why money is equated with God is because money, in, in Jesus' mind, when he's preaching about it, money is, is kind of like another God, memory. So idolatry. I think, you know, the, the first commandment that God had to the people of Israel, he said, you shall not have another God. Don't have another God. And, and I, most people miss on it. And if my interpretation is wrong, I mean, you're welcome to go and do your research and talk to people, but this is how I see it today. When God says, you shall not have another God, and you shall not have another God, and you shall not make any images of God. I think there are two reasons that are not so obvious. That that's why they fit into this category. Um, which is, first of all, you shall not have another God. Because God doesn't want to be the center. You know, we sing songs like, oh, Jesus be the center of it all. I don't think Jesus wants to be the center because our life is not supposed to be a circle where Jesus is in the center, but surrounding, there are so many other gods that we just like, every now and again, we go there. And I don't think Jesus wants to be the first either because people go like, oh, you know, he's the first. He's my, my, no, he doesn't want to be the first because he doesn't want any seconds. Like God does not share his glory with anyone else. You have to understand that. So it's not like I've, well, I'll worship God first and then I'll like a little bit of this God and that other God. No, no, he doesn't want that. 
He wants to be the only one, not the first, not the center, but just the only one. That's why no idolatry, no other gods, right? no other gods. And then he says, you shall not make any image of God. <laughs> and, and why the image? You know, obviously the people of Israel, they came from, the, from this background where they, you know, they had pagan gods and they had images. And we, we, we can understand that because we have knowledge today. We have the Bible, we can read, we have hindsight. But for them, I think what God was trying to hint on was you can't make any image of me because you can't understand me. You, you will never know who I am. It's like if, if I can understand God, I'll bring my understanding of God down to earth and then I'll make this little idol so I can bow down before this idol which is dead. There's no life in that idol but I'll just bow down because it's a reference point. God's not a reference point. You know what I mean? As, as a matter of fact, we, we have separated God and us. And I think the idea that we have missed out completely is that God is not somewhere that you go. We find ourselves in God. That's why when you read the New Testament, in most of the places, you will see that we, have, we find our, lives, our life in Jesus. So if you're in Christ, you're a new creation. God dwells in you. So it's a, it's a two-way thing. And it's like God is everywhere. Everything is God. And we just find ourselves in there. That changes everything because then I can't make an idol of something that is beyond any comprehension. I can't. I can't. Uh, we, we live in this world where we try to make God our image when in, in reality <laughs> He made us His image. So if there is any little idol being built, <laughs> we, we are the little idols. <laughs> but God, like God cannot be made into an image. So I want to encourage you. You know, there's the obvious your phone, the internet, all of that. That's, that's obvious. Like you're mature. You, you, you're way past that. And then there's not so obvious. We all get caught up in that not so obvious thing. The ego, um, our knowledge. There's so many other things. But idolatry. And then there's the oblivious. What, what's, what's oblivious? When you say someone it's oblivious to such a thing, it's like they can't even see. Have you, have you ever heard that expression is um, something is hidden in plain sight? Have you ever heard that expression? That the, the point is this, most of us are oblivious to the reality of God. We live life as if God is not here. And we, we think we're going to face God at some point, but not now. Because now is, you know, in the present, God's not here, like this, this is all me. And that's the oblivious. So I wanted to close this message with the passage, which is Philippians chapter 3. By the way, I love Philippians. Like I, if, if you haven't read Philippians yet, like Philippians is amazing, amazing. But I want to read uh, chapter 3, around like verse 4 or something. And then we'll, we'll read the whole chapter. Uh, I wish I had my paper Bible with me, but um, I can give you some ideas. But it's a beautiful thing. But I, I need you to just stay with me because I know, you know, <laughs> that's why it's oblivious. The obvious, your phone, all of that, it's a distraction. And at this point of the video, you're probably like, oh, turn off Philippians, I already know. You, you want to move on, don't. Don't, because this is what we are oblivious to. It's hidden in plain sight. It's right under our nose and we forget it. So the main message is not what I just shared with you, the obvious and not so obvious, but the main message is right here. This is what, this is what brings power. Everything else is just knowledge, but this is power. So I, I, I want to read this with you, uh, Philippians chapter 3, and we'll go, um, how about we go verse uh, 5. Let's read the whole thing. Right? Let's, just, let's just read the whole thing. Verse 1. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. Like he's concluding the letter. Rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me. And it's safe for you. So Paul is saying, look, I, I, I want to I wanna encourage you to rejoice in the Lord at all times. This is no trouble for me. I'll write it again and again and again, over and over, because this is, this is the point. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the bad people around you. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. He's talking about people who are bringing these weird ideas into the church. For we are the circumcision. So this is how Paul identifies himself. Like we're the Christian people. We're the followers of the way. We, we have seen and met and faced Jesus face to face. So we're not those people. We are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. So remember... We're talking about ego. No confidence in the flesh. Most people are oblivious to this. That's why I want you to get. No confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks that he has reason for confidence in the flesh, 
I have more. So this is Paul saying, you know what? You want to talk about skills? I got the skills. You want to talk about basketball? MJ's got nothing on me. You want to talk about NFL? Patrick Mahomes got nothing on me. You want to talk about civil rights movement? Martin Luther King has got nothing on me. I got the whole thing. Like, I, I'm, I'm the man. This is Paul. Like, if, if, if we are supposed to boast, I'm the man. So here's the deal. I'm circumcising the eighth day. Big deal for the Jewish people. Of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, I'm a Pharisee. As to zeal, I'm a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, I'm blameless. Look, man, you got to be bold to say something like this. As to the law, I'm blameless. Because when Paul wrote the letter to Romans, he said, no one is good. No one obeys the law. No one will be saved by accomplishing or fulfilling the law. And Paul is saying, you know what? According to the law, I'm blameless. No one can find any blame, any shame, any stain on my life. And I'm like, ooh, that's, that's, God, that's heavy. That's heavy. And then he goes, um, blameless. But whatever gain I had, this is the beautiful part. <laughs> whatever gain I had, you know, being blameless under the law, being a fair receiver, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. None of the things I just showed you guys is worth nothing. This, this, is, this is it. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them all as rubbish in order that I, might gain, I may gain Christ and be found in him. That's what I was telling you about. In him. Paul had this understanding. Paul wasn't going anywhere. He was, he was just trying to find himself in him, that I might be found in him, not having the righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and share his sufferings, become like him in his death, that by any means possible, I, by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. So here's Paul saying, look, I got, I, I got a goal. I got an end goal in mind. I want to attain the resurrection of the dead. I, I want to attain the resurrection from the dead. I want to know Christ. That's all I want to know. Everything I have is rubbish. Everything I've accomplished is rubbish. And then he keeps going. Not that I have obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on. This is my favorite part. I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus had made his own. Brothers, I don't consider that I've made it my own. You see humility coming through? Like there's no ego here. He, he boasted first that you show people, look, I could if I wanted to, but I, I, I want to be humble here. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call. Oh, sorry, verse 13. Brothers, I don't consider that I've made it on my own, but one thing I do, <laughs> one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and looking forward to the prize and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Everything that's past is gone. I, I, I don't look to those things. My accolades, my certificates, my diplomas, my knowledge, my accomplishments, my achievements, all rubbish. But I press on. Like I literally, I press on. Are you having a hard time? Press on. Is it difficult? Press on. Too many things happening at the same time? Press on, forget what's behind, look forward to the prize of the upward call of Jesus Christ. That's, that's, that's Paul. This is like, it's beautiful. Let those of us who are mature. <laughs> this is, this is, I mean, I, I keep saying this is my favorite part. The whole thing is my favorite. But Paul is saying, look, let those who are mature think this way. I love this because people think that the goal of the gospel of Jesus Christ is to save people. No. The goal of the cross is to save you. Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins and to swap places with you. So that saves you. You, you. you don't need the gospel, the story of Jesus for your salvation. That saves you. But the goal of the gospel is to bring you to maturity. That's the goal of the gospel. We, at the end of the day, God has given the prophets, the apostles, the teachers, the pastors, everyone to equip the church for the work of ministry so we can achieve the maturity of Jesus Christ. At the end of the day, we are looking to Jesus as our example. That's the goal of the gospel. And to mature people, mature people should think this way. Mature people should think, you know what? Everything I have is rubbish. I look to Jesus Christ. I'm, like, I could boast on my own things, but mm, let's just 
focus there. That's, that's mature people thinking. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal to you also. That's the confidence that Paul had. Paul's, Paul's looking around and saying, you know what? I want to talk to mature people, but if you haven't matured yet, that's all right. God will reveal it to you. I don't, I don't have to push anything. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. It's, I, I don't think this is arrogance. I think this is self-awareness. This is Paul saying, look, I could, I, I could boast about the law. I will choose not to. I will, I will strain ahead to, to the prize of Jesus Christ, but imitate me. For many of whom I have often told you, and I'll tell you, even with tears. Like, <laughs> Paul is not happy that these people are making a mess in the church. Even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. That doesn't bring any pleasure to anyone. Their God is their belly and their glory in their shame with mindset on earthly things. <laughs> Ego, idolatry, knowledge, busyness, money. As far as I'm concerned, this is all earthly things. This is, none of this is eternal. None of this is going to help you in any way, shape, or form to attain the crown of glory. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is, this is, how, Paul, this is how Paul lived. I mean, based on what we read. He's saying, you know what, my passport... It's not Australian, it's not Brazilian, it's not New Zealand, I've got them all. <laughs> my passport, it's not that, my passport's from heaven. And I'm not waiting on an answer from the government. I'm not waiting on an answer to solve my problems from the prime minister. I'm not waiting on an answer from Donald Trump or Barack Obama or whoever's running. I'm not waiting on an answer from money. I'm not waiting on any of those things because all, all of those things are earthly. I'm waiting on my savior from heaven. My life is hidden with him. And we're all waiting on our Savior. That's how I live my life. So there is no center or no first. There's only one life. And I am that life with Christ Jesus. I'm waiting. That's it. My citizenship is in heaven. And then he finishes. And then he says, We wait. We await our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform your lowly body, your earthly things, your earthly mind, your lowly body, to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, this is the first verse of chapter 4, and I'll finish here. Therefore, my brothers, whom I have love, or whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown. Like this is Paul talking to Philippians. Now, I'm not sure if we can say we have the same level of relationship, probably not. But just presuming that you're watching this and you've you've come to this point and you're like, oh, this, this is good, man. It's a good reminder, it's a good message. So I'm gonna say. You are my joy. You are my crown. Like I'm, I'm, I'm begging you. My joy and my crown. Stand firm in the Lord. The, the whole stand firm in the Lord for me is in, in 21st century words. Don't get distracted. Don't get distracted. Don't get focused on your money. Don't get focused on idolatry. Don't get focused on your ego. Don't get focused on just increasing your knowledge. Don't get distracted. But because th th this is my conclusion. The devil doesn't need to convince you to become a Satanist. He just needs to distract you from the main thing. That's all he does. He's a master deceiver. You know how magicians do their tricks? The, the number one skill for magicians is distraction. They don't make things disappear. They distract your eyes while they do the trick. That's what the devil does. He distracts you. But we, followers of Jesus, followers of the way, we don't lose our focus. We keep looking forward. We keep looking to our crown. We keep pursuing our crown. We keep sanctifying ourselves. We keep pursuing a life of holiness because that is the end goal. And I hope this message has somehow inspired you to think, you know, we live in a world where the devil's trying to steal our intimacy with God at all times. And it is our job not, not to gain that intimacy, but to keep the intimacy. Because once you've been saved, he has come to live in you. He has made a dwelling in you so if he has there is no need for you to strive for a relationship you already have a relationship you just got to make sure you focus on the right side of the relationship <laughs> and with that my friend i conclude i hope you've enjoyed it and if you if you want to know more there's a bunch of links down in the description 
uh, you can you can leave your comment here. It's I really appreciate when you do because then we we know who we're talking to. But nonetheless, I appreciate you. You're my crown and my joy. And I hope you've enjoyed this. And I'll see you on the next video. God bless.